Hey, Seattle. Lived there 14 years, new to Chicago. I miss it so much. Welcome, Kelsey. All right, Caldwell, Ohio. Yes, yes. Wisconsin. Welcome, Matt. Northern Ohio near Cleveland. Welcome. Those just jo just joining us, we're just taking a moment to say hi in the chat and just to let us know where you call home. And Susan calls New York City the Bronx home. I love that. Gabe, one of our presenters, is uh, from originally from Hartford. Stephanie from Los Angeles grew up in Minneapolis. <laughs> I bet going home is quite a shock weather-wise. <laughs> Well, welcome everybody. And let's see. Oh, let's see how many, how many people we got. We got a pretty good crowd. It's um, two after two. So I think we're gonna go ahead and get started if that's all right with everybody. And feel feel free to continue to keep the chat alive, keep it going in the chat. And thank you again for, for being here. And we are in for an engaging presentation this afternoon with mentors from two cohorts, Bentley Moses with CORE and Gabe Schuster with CHS, who are coming together and bringing their unique insights and areas of expertise to bring you today's topic, which is data use cases and equity considerations in multi-sector data sharing. And as you can see from the agenda, here's what we have planned, uh, friendly reminders to kick us off, and then um, we'll just dive right into the topic. And then we're going to have uh, some updates and events to close this out. And before we kick off, if anybody needs anything, please feel free to DM Susan Martinez in the chat and um, she will help you out. And um, if you have at any point questions, uh, please feel free to drop your questions in the chat or use the reaction button there to um, raise your hand and when the time comes there'll be an opportunity for, for us to ask questions and so just remember that those options are there. And next slide. And a friendly reminder that Susan is also your primary point of contact for um, from our program office, but um, please feel free to reach out to myself or Anna, any of us at any time if you have questions or need to talk, uh, need to talk through anything. Next slide. And as a reminder, this is us. This is our Mentor 3 cohort. And if you're interested in making any connections along the way, um, this is a great slide to reference. And please ask your, um, your mentors for points of contact. Or again, we're available to help connect you if there's anybody that you want to connect with along the way. Next slide. And a brief reminder of why we're here. Um, as the slide said, cross cohort learning. So we're really interested in benefiting, everybody benefiting from the expertise of our mentors and learning from each other as, mu as much as possible. And um, our goals are just to connect with each other and um, gather around common topics and, and data sharing and benefit from the expertise. And also just a nice time to get some updates and reminders from us, the, the, the um, program office. And um, some suggested ways for follow up is continuing to talk about the content either in your next cohort meeting or the next time the, that you check in um, as a team or during your one on one so good time to, to kind of debrief in those settings. Next slide. As a reminder, all in data for community health is a resource and it's um, an opportunity to get together share ideas share best practices and advance the work that you do. And here's just a real quick high level snapshot of what we do throughout the year. Some of the programs that we coordinate, podcasts, webinars, we have affinity groups, um, newsletters. Uh, we have a big national meeting coming up in November. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that towards the end. And then the next slide, I wanted to just let everybody know, I know that um, many of you are, have, are participating in the affinity groups and um, and just a heads up that they are winding, winding down. They were a nine, nine month pilot program sort of activity and uh, All In does plan to launch a second round in 2022. And so if you're interested in participating, the best way is just 
get the newsletter, monitor the newsletter. That's where a lot of our um, messaging will come out about what we plan for next. Next slide. And another friendly reminder is that um, each mentor, me mentor cohort has space in the online community where um, you can talk about today's presentation and a bunch of other items and um, also an opportunity to talk about your work and also is where we're going to put the recording for today and any handouts or resources and notes. And let's see, I believe that is it for me. I'm going to turn it over to our presenter team, starting with Gabe. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Miriam. Uh, and we can just, I think, jump over to the next slide. Uh, we're going to walk through the agenda for today. So kicking it off with a word from Dash, uh, check. Uh, doing a quick welcome and introductions. Uh, presenters will sort of, uh, we'll do a, a quick intro. Um, we're going to go through the learning goals for today uh, and then presentations on sort of data use cases and equity considerations, common data types, uh, and then we'll walk through an equity analysis example uh, and thinking through how we can use equity analysis as part of a community process. Uh, and lastly, we will wrap up with some discussion and Q&A. So next slide. Uh, so by way of quick introductions, my name is Gabe Schuster. I'm a senior program manager at CSH, which is the Corporation for Supportive Housing. Uh, I'm based out of Brooklyn, New York. I am joined uh, by my cat who might be sitting just out of frame, but if you see a head pop into uh, the video, that's uh, him waking up, I think. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Kim. And I'm on mute as you know how to make that mistake at least twice a day. Um, so Kim Keaton, I'm director of data and analytics for uh, CSH Corporation for Supportive Housing. Um, we uh, I head up uh, our data and analytics strategy um, across the, our work across the country um, alongside Gabe and a couple other folks. Um, I, yeah, we've been a uh, Dash mentor for three years now, and it's been a great experience. Um, I were, I've been at CSH 10 years, and um, although, as I said in the chat, I am originally from Orange County, California, but I've spent a lot of time in both New York and Los Angeles, and now I find myself smack dab in the middle of the country in Kansas City, Missouri. And hi, everyone. I'm Bentley Moses, they, them pronouns, um, with the Center for Outcomes Research and Education. I'm a program manager um, overseeing analytics and policy here at CORE. Um, and my background is in public health, health systems, program development, um, and excited to talk to you a little bit about uh, data today. We also have Hannah Cohen Klein on the call, who is the director of research and evaluation at CORE, um, who might chime in with responses or uh, thoughts on any of your questions. So quick review of uh, just the learning goals that we have laid out for today. So. First off is to understand data use cases and how to develop them, how they fit into sort of the broader data strategy and uh, process that you all might take into your work. Understanding the benefits and risks of collecting, analyzing, and reporting equity data. Um, and then lastly, choosing and using data with an equity lens. So I think all these things are gonna tie together really nicely, super excited. Uh, also to see sort of the conversation going in the chat while we get through these different pieces. Um, so yeah, please feel free to chime in in the chat at any point. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Bentley. Thanks, Gabe. <clears throat> so we're gonna start with talking through a data use case. Um, so this graphic defines what is the purpose of a data use case. Um, your purpose is what guides your data use case, which in turn drives your operational decisions like your data sharing agreements. So for your data use case, your goal is to acquire the data you need. So you need to know why you need the data. You need to have goals, partners, a resource plan and a value proposition. So what is the value and purpose of your work in hand? It's really hard to ask partners to share data if you can't state your goals, value and your data uses super clearly. 
Um, so your purpose aims for your work should help you inform all the decisions that you make around your strategy and your next steps. And that includes setting up for your data use case. So what data you'll need, where or who you'll obtain that data from, what the end products are that you have in mind for that data, and how you will provide that end product for your partners. Next slide. So what is a data use case? <clears throat> a data use case is how you frame the way you will and won't use data um, towards your purpose. It documents who will use the data, what questions you'll answer, how you'll access the data, and how you plan, how your plan is consistent with any legal restrictions on how the data can be used. So it might answer some of the questions that you see here on the right. Um, your data use case is really the key definer of how your data can and will be used. Um, you might write your data use case down in a single document, or it might not be written down at all. It really depends. We encourage our mentees to use these questions on the slides, which you'll have access to, to help them run through just what are the pieces of the data use case um, that set it up. For core, we use this documentation. Um, we do usually write our data use case out, and that's really helpful in making sure that everyone has a shared understanding of our purpose. And then we can refer back to that use case to help guide decisions throughout the project. We often attach it to um, data sharing grievance as well. Whether or not you have it written down, though, it's really important that you have the answers to these types of questions listed on the right-hand side of this slide. Next slide. So why do you need to define a data use case? Um, it's really important to define your data use case so you can demonstrate that you have a plan, so you can make the case to your partners, inform and accompany data sharing agreements, and document decisions and operational details. Data use cases can be used in a lot of different ways. Um, we commonly use them, as I mentioned, to persuade others um, around the purpose and the intention. And then, as I mentioned, we attach them to our data sharing agree agreements for additional clarity about where that data is coming from and where it will go. Um, so an example is from CORE's work is we were talking to a local school district on sharing data on student absences, um, wanted that information from them. So we wrote up a data use case that talked about how our project would look at student absenteeism, as well as health and housing, and how this would align with the district strategic plan. So it was really helpful to document purpose and also document connection to the work that that partner was doing in that data world as well. Next slide. So part of your data use case is getting really crisp on who will access and use the data. You want to have really clearly identified roles of your partners, user groups, and audiences. This box of questions as well, um, we ask our mentees to walk through and try those out, get responses to those questions, because it can really help you define who will access and use that data. Um, data use cases can be more internally or externally oriented and contain more or less technical or legal information, depending on what your project is, um, what the sources of data you need to use, and the restrictions around those data. In addition to the structure or format of the data and legal authority to use the data for your purposes, your data use case should outline considerations on how the data should be accessed, stored, and used. So it's really important to emphasize data privacy in these areas as well. Um, one example from CORE's work is we um, had a data sharing project with Southwest Washington. We aggregated all of our data from our partners, but we cannot share individual labeled data back with a different sector. So can't share one from health with criminal justice that's at an individual level, for example. So when our education partner asked if we could give them a list of children enrolled in the district who were not, who were also on Medicaid, we had to say no. It was really clearly defined in our use case. Um, we could share summary information, but not an identified list, and that was um, defined in our use case and then in our data sharing agreement that was informed by that use case. Next slide. Another um, important element of a data use case is getting clear on what is the minimum necessary data you need to do your work. Um, it's really exciting sometimes to get access to big bodies of data and want to include as much data as possible, but you want to consider the ethical, legal, legal and logistical implementation implications of that data that you seek. 
So it's super clear to be, or it's super important to be clear on what data is essential to your project. It might be possible to procure more data than is essential, but um, you, know, you want to have those things really clearly defined. So again, these questions, what elements will be used for what purpose? How will the elements be linked or combined? Um, are great questions to walk through and ask um, everyone within your team um, and get clear on what your data use case will be um, and clearly define those minimum use needs. Next slide. So we want to think through within the context of our data uh, use case development, which, you know, as I have walked through all of these slides are really logistical, sort of those building blocks of what is the purpose, where will this be accessed, who will use it, what is the intention, getting crisp on all of those questions and clarifying your use case, either in a separate piece of documentation or just as a understanding within your organization. Um, but we want to overlay that with equity considerations for the data sharing that we're going to be doing within that use case. Next slide. Um, we talk a lot in CORE's uh, mentorship about how data is not neutral. There's limitations and biases for all of our data. Um, it's important to consider what those limitations are and what biases exist. Um, so some of the key questions here are why was that data initially collected data might be collected for different purposes so operational or or to support resource or research you want to be uh, clear on understanding what the intention was for collecting that data because um, some data might have been reported for through different methods such as self-reporting um, or via providers uh, or it might be system generated. All of those different ways that that data was reported may not be applicable to your question or to your program. So um, getting clear on why that was collected the way that it was originally and whether that connects directly to your work. Um, there are also, uh, you know, framing out what questions can the data answer and what can it not answer? So for example, healthcare claims data is a good source uh, to answer questions about utilization of care like number of visits, but it's not great for answering questions about clinical outcomes, things like test results, results or health status. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about claims data and different specific types of data and how that might be useful to you. Um, another thing that's really great to think about is, uh, you know, what data elements were defined in that data that you're pulling and who made those decisions, what power structures, what um, individuals or groups really uh, were the governance uh, of those data elements. So for example, a program might collect race ethnicity on alignment uh, in alignment with a federal grant, um, but the population they serve might not identify with those categories. So it's, it's important to understand who decides why those categories were picked and how is that information collected and does it resonate with the community it's being collected from. So again, a great exercise is to walk through all of these questions with your data and see if you can answer them. Um, and then find out more information in areas where you can't. Next slide. Risks and benefits um, are another key part of that equity overlay within your use case. So what are the benefits? What are the risks? Who stands to benefit most? Um, what are the benefits for impacted populations or the biases that are present for those populations? How might data replicate or compound structural racism and inequality? What safeguards do you have? Um, and how could data be misused or represented, misrepresented in findings? Um, this is this and the next slide are pulled from Actionable Intelligence for Social Policy, um, which is a great resource from University of Pennsylvania that we can share out with these slides. It's got some excellent considerations for how data is used, especially in administrative areas um, and equity considerations within that data. A lot of our existing, existing systems are not built, are built on inequitable practices and power structures. So it's really important if we don't examine these assumptions, we will potentially uphold that flawed status quo. And we really miss risking, uh, or we really risk missing key insights um, as we're upholding that. So, I mean, something that I want to call out that, that comes up a lot in our work um, around biases are, you know, what assumptions are you bringing to the table? What is the impact of that? So, for example, selection bias, 
when people are present in the data um, do not represent the intended population or the population of interest. So you might, that example before, if you're sampling people who may not identify with a certain race ethnicity category, um, that's a potential for selection bias. Uh, you might only have information for people who opt in to provide their data. Or, and then there's also potentially people who are missing who did not um, choose to opt in or chose to intentionally opt out. So lots of considerations and questions to walk through, um, especially when you're trying to think about, you know, what is the implication for structural racism and inequality and how are we upholding that by potentially using data structures or data systems that were not built with um, the people we're hoping to serve in mind. Next slide. So one activity that, um, has been really beneficial for us and you know has uh, been helpful for some of our mentees is looking through you know what is the risk benefit ratio so while the particular is important you can consider risk alongside benefit um, and see what that might look like in terms of using different data sources for different use cases for example projects that involve low risk and high benefit such as a longitudinal program evaluation um, for indicator projects or you know just generating unduplicated counts across programs it's generally a good those are generally a good idea and they're an easy starting point for collaboration for cross-sector data sharing on the other side projects that are low benefit and high risk like linking social media with education records or police surveillance with biometric data those um, should really be considered with extreme caution um, and in some cases data sharing should not proceed it's really not a yes, no binary, um, but rather just a lens to talk and think through the intended or unintended consequences of how you are using your data. Next slide. So just sort of a last statement here, a reminder, data are never neutral. It's important to understand the limits of our data when we are developing our use case. Um, sometimes we tend to think of data as a truthful, objective, and unbiased output. In the ways that we collect, analyze, and report and talked about data, we're not neutral. We bring biases and assumptions to this work, and a lot of our existing systems are built on inequitable practices and power structures. So if we don't examine these assumptions, we'll not, we will uh, only uphold a potentially flawed status quo. And then we'll also miss risking those key insights. So if we wanna make a change, we wanna pay explicit attention to the way that our data work can promote or hinder equity and inclusion in our communities particularly for marginalized or vulnerable groups. Um, throughout our mentorship, we've been talking through different resources that can support ethical data practices. Um, and our goal is to center uh, and consider equity throughout the data life cycle. And that data use case is a really important iterative piece of that work where you can visit, visit and revisit um, what the equity implications are for your work throughout your project period. Next slide. Awesome. So we wanted to pose sort of a discussion question. I think folks can feel free to either type their response into the chat, um, or if you want to come off mute and sort of talk through uh, what you're thinking about. But it has that you take a second and think about what your sort of most critical data sharing project currently is. Um, and if you could summarize the data use case for it. And I would also be curious to hear uh, if people want to add on to that also. Uh, what the equity considerations or benefits and risks might be for that data sharing project. Um, so we'll give folks a, a little bit of time if they want to either type those things out, but also definitely welcome to uh, come off mute and uh, add your voice to the conversation. All right, so Iggy added uh, identification retrieval, homeless history documentation, and program use documentation. So sounds to me a lot around trying to get a better understanding of uh, people's sort of history, service utilization, and needs.
see, Kim added a uh, health information exchange data share with HMIS. Uh, so housing management, homelessness management information system uh, for the provision of housing services for medically frail. Uh, and Matt Ryerson added exploring the creation of an early education network and determining what currently exists, uh, standards, curriculum or academic standards, accessibility and affordability. Um, really cool exploratory case there. And we also have one that is definitely uh, more evaluative, it seems to me. So looking at the correlation and causation relationship between early childhood learning opportunities and high school graduation rates. So really cool to see how some of these can be exploratory, uh, others can be really evaluative. So I'm seeing um, identifying, evaluating, measuring food insufficiency in Maui County. Super fascinating one. Merging community health education data, including referrals to DV services and other sensitive data uh, to other hospital services. It's a really interesting one too. Definitely complicated uh, systems with a lot of like data protections and questions around security and uh, safety there. Really interesting piece. Curious if anyone also had thoughts around um, sort of the equity considerations for those different projects. So we've also got uh, measuring the success of intensive case management for financial stability outcomes, another evaluative piece. All right, so we'll continue to have these trickle in and I think we can move on to sort of the next piece, which is going to be around common data types. And I think uh, Bentley will kick us off with that. Thank you. Yeah, next slide. So for this, we just wanna talk through some examples of data that you might pull, um, data you might use within your program. Um, Many of you are probably using these data sources already, but as part of developing your data use case and then considering the equity implications um, of that data that lives within your use case, um, it's great to know, you know, sort of the pros and cons and the sources of uh, different data types. Um, so we're going to start with a few health related data. So healthcare claims, you can see here on the screen. Um, you know, your uses are for research, population health, cost. Um, it's a really comprehensive record of health services, but it doesn't provide clinical outcomes. And there's a big lag time between service and processing. Um, legal, legal considerations are really important for this. So this is governed by HIPAA and 42 CFR part two, which will be something you'll wanna think about in terms of access um, and uh, data sharing needs. Um, and uh, for us, we use, you know, an all pair uh, claims database. You can find this in uh, state Medicaid programs and also within health plans. Um, so these just, I should also um, add some additional precautions around healthcare claims data. These are financial records more than medical, medical records. So they bundle payments and billing codes to make, um, the bundle payments and billing codes make it impossible to see receipt of certain services like screening during well visits things like that. Um, so you, you need to know that you need to check in um, uh, before jumping through different hoops to gain access. Um, the large number that live within these claims, so there's a really large N, um, that doesn't mean it's generalizable to a region's population. Um, so even though there's a large number, it may not represent the region that you're trying to look at. Um, it's not necessarily a good measure of need or incidence prevalence. Um, it might be limited to people who have medical coverages and then sought to receive that care. So just things to think about when thinking about the implications of who's opting in or who's opting out potentially with that. Um, and even, even though it's so-called the all-payer database, 
Um, those are sometimes incomplete and missing certain types of coverage. So for example, with CORE, um, the all payers claim database we work with in Washington does not provide access to Medicare uh, fee for service data and only captures about two thirds of the commercial market. So it still is leaving a lot of people out within that data. So again, who's within that data, who's out of that data? Um, just things to think about with healthcare claims. Next slide. So this is electronic health record data. So those are clinical encounters, things like diagnoses, uh, vitals, progress notes, tests. Um, these get, this data gets used for research, for population health, to understand utilization. They also get used for quality. Um, this, uh, this data is great um, for being aggregated by service type episode for, by patients. Um, you can provide information on clinical outcomes, markers, social determinants, things like that. Some of the challenges here though, um, it's a really complex database. Um, large data sets can require specific expertise and specific tools that maybe your organization has or doesn't have um, in order to analyze. And then the data changes frequently and may not have consistent quality checks, which is something that we've run into a couple of times at CORE. So that can be really hard when you're trying to look for very specific things within that aggregate data. Um, their EHR tables are really complex um, and sometimes they're a little messy relative to claims data. So you might need someone who's got specific expertise in this kind of data. Um, and uh, some EHRs, or EHR, sources, EHR systems do contain clinical history of patients uh, with ongoing or ended status, but not all EHRs will have all of the data elements if someone you know, left the system or is no longer seeking care. So um, that can be something that's challenging when trying to figure out sort of who's within that data set and who is not within that data set. Um, this is also governed by HIPAA 42 CFR. And you can find this within health systems, private practices, clinics. Um, there are some states that also have these kinds of clinical repositories with this kind of data. Um, so it's great data for um, some specific needs, but uh, can have some limitations and challenges for folks. And I've got a question, HIEs, what's, what's a HIE? HIEs came, I'm sorry, Kim, if you would mind spelling out your acronym, maybe I can help you with that question. Health information exchanges. Oh, thank you. Um, Hannah, what is, do you know, what is the, do health, uh, the HIEs have uh, claims or EHR? Uh, my understanding is they have EHR. Thank you. That's what I thought as well. Yeah. Next slide. So the last health piece we're gonna talk about is public health data. So this is more broad um, data um, from a population perspective, things like uh, vital statistics, disease registries, um, outbreak, outbreak reg uh, records, survey data, things like that. So it's great for surveillance, population health management or disease management. Um, it, this is much more representative of an entire region. So while um, claims and EHR data is specific to a slice of the population accessing that space. This might have more um, relatability to a region or a state. Um, and then it's really good for showing trends over time for those different areas. Um, there's a longer lag time for this data, so that can be a challenge. Um, and access um, can also potentially be a, cha a challenge. Um, some of the issues that we've had with it as well are, it, you know, uh, if you're looking for something that gets down to a zip code or gets down to, um, you know, a small population, there are some, uh, you know, privacy implications there, and and that data can't be shared if if the population level is uh, too small, um, and there is often not individual level data um, or identifiable data. So again, more generalizable, more um, overall population picture. Um, some other limitations to consider around this is geographic boundaries like census tracts aren't always meaningful from a population health perspective. Oftentimes this is organized into census tracts, so um, that may or may not have connection or relevance to your work. Um, this is a great complement to working with claims data because you can talk about whole populations, which can be useful in articulating a need or a problem. 
but it might not be as useful if you're trying to mobilize specific partners or groups um, because it is so broad potentially. Um, it's great, or it's it's governed by HIPAA um, and some states statutes or um, you know, mandatory reporting requirements. So you'll need to check in with what your state requirements are for public health data. Um, and you can find this at public health departments, uh, county or state, um, and then the CDC, so federal level. So those are um, access points for public health data within your region. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Gabe to talk about a few other data sources. Uh, actually, Kim is going to take uh, oh, the next great. couple. Yep. Yeah, I'm sneaking onto the presentation today. <laughs> um, so uh, we, we wanted to be sure and mention homeless management information systems, which was something that was sort of uh, mentioned earlier. Um, that this is really the uh, every homeless continuum of care, which is the funded body of um you know basically collection of of data or of of uh funding sources that fund all your shelters and many of your housing interventions and rapid rehousing in a in a given re region each one of these cocs continues of care mandated to track um homeless services utilization uh, via an hmis system so this is one of those federal data sets that has data standards and that uh, are fairly um, that are similar from you know continuum of care to continuum of care because they're following um, a set of guidelines and um, you know requirements from set by HUD. Um, there are multiple data project products that come out of homeless management information systems, sometimes um, HMIS plus some some other type of count. Um, and these are listed out there, a bunch of um, acronyms, but they stand for uh, homeless point in time count, housing inventory chart, annual homeless um, assessment report. Stella is a, a performance um, tool that COCs have access to via HUD. Um, really what we're tracking with uh, HMIS systems are uh, some, you know, of course, client um, demographics, um, some health information, but it's going to be pretty light touch and self-report. It's not, for example, verified by a doctor, or entered by a nurse, or anything like that. Um, and so it might be somebody who's self-reporting um, that they have, have a mental health, you know, or substance use issues, something like that. Um, the you know the the utilization records. Um, and exits are what combine come you know helps us helps COCs monitor program performance, and so really how people are moving through shelters, permanent housing, where they're coming from to those places, and where they're exiting to, uh, and why are they exiting? Are they going to jail? Are they going to high level higher level of care? Are they returning to homelessness, um, etc. And so so those in, in those, that information is used to monitor performance. Um, so the pros are, like I said, these established universal universal data standards and elements are what um, makes these, you know, even across various vendors makes the data sets really similar. Um, there are some cons, which, you know, you have large COCs as big as the city of New York or most of the, of the county of Los Angeles, and then you have, you know, ones that are what we call um, balance of state continuums of care and the state that I live in in Missouri, this is like every area of the state except for maybe three of the large cities. They're all part of one continuum of care. So think about um, the, you know, difference in, you know, differences in uh, capability and quality across all those people entering data. It's also data that's entered by many hands. So within a continuum of care, you have people at the shelter, at housing providers um, entering data in. So it's just, it, it can really um, have, it can really result in some variation in data quality. Um, you know, I think that uh, also um, it can be challenging to access. Um, you know, it's, it's many times access to the data is controlled 
by a nonprofit entity. Um, just as many times, it's also it's controlled by a government entity, and there are you know sort of different abilities or willingnesses to share on either of those. Um, the uh, you know when we look at people who are presenting at um, homeless shelters and you know in points of entry into the homeless system, it's not a comprehensive uh, note, or it's not a comprehensive view of all people with housing instability in a region. There's folks that are doubled up, there are folks on the street that never come in, there are folks that live out in the woods, um, there are people um, in institutions of care who may have been homeless previously or, or are highly at risk of homelessness upon exit. So it's limited in that respect. Um, one um, thing to really point out is on the legal side, um, it is not subject to HIPAA. So even though it may contain some self-report health information, self-report health information that's part of an assessment is not subject to HIPAA or um, 42 CFR. And so it's really up to, um, you know, there are some privacy um, standards that need to be met. There are release of, releases of information that need to be signed um, by each person. There are, are policies and procedures that are set by the various jurisdictions. Um, but, and there are, a why I should say just, this is the space in which I'm, I'm probably most comfortable. There are just so, a wide variety of, um, willingnesses to share and, um, you know, where folks have been successful are um, sharing, for example, with um, healthcare entities like a managed care or a public, you know, uh, health plan in order to better coordinate housing um, opportunities for folks. There's lots of examples of sharing across justice systems to prioritize folks who have experienced uh, repeated incarcerations for housing interventions. And so it's a little easier to share. That doesn't mean it's easy, but um, but that's that's HMIS. And I think the the next one, next slide is mine as well. Education data. So I think you know most people are familiar that um, school systems collect data, um, you know, there is graduate, yes, they're required to collect um, some things, uh, graduation rates, dropout rates, attendance, and um, data on utilization of school connected services. That does include, um, by the way, uh, information on uh, families that may be experiencing homelessness. Uh, they use a different definition uh, on the education side. But anyone who's ever registered a child for a new school year has answered those questions about doubled up and uh, other things uh, living uh, in places that meant for human habitation and things like that. That's where that goes. Um, it's often, it's used for a lot of research and evaluation of educational programs and outcomes, um, you know, identifying service needs. Um, it can show trends over time and, and help identify otherwise hard to capture population. Importantly, from an equity perspective, it can really show uh, differences over time um, in outcomes for um, different populations and, and, you know, for example, BIPOC populations. Um, it's really complicated. The data can be really complicated. Um, I mean, depending on uh, what you're, I, I've worked with this data, it can be pretty complicated depending on what you're trying to do uh, and longitudinally over time. It's, it, um, you know, if it's a small, small data set over a short period of time, it's easy. The, the bigger you get and the longer you get, it's, it's much more complex. Um, the, um, there's no universal format across school districts. So, you know, and as we know, there are loads of private and charter and other types of schools that have different things that they're collecting. Um, so that's another thing um, to take into consideration. Um, it's governed by, um, oh God, I can't, I can't remember what that acronym stands for. It's like Federal Education Something Privacy Act. Privacy Act. I can't remember what the R stands for. It's um, because there's children involved. It's very restrictive. It's probably just as restrictive as, as um, HIPAA. Um, and then um, finally, uh, you know, school districts use aggregate, re report this aggregated 
um, you know, to the state, to the DOE. Um, this is how the federal government, state governments, the federal governments measure progress. Um, so that's education data. And I believe there's the last one we're going to discuss is on the next slide, which is criminal and, and um, ju you know, I prefer to call it justice system data. The justice system has many um, parts. Thank you. Rights. Um, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. I got the Privacy Act part right. Um, so, you know, the justice system has many different parts and there are just as many data systems along each along the way, you know, um, they're the the primary um, place that folks get data from is usually at um, bookings into institutions like jails or prisons. There are other data sets that are at the court level um, that are on, you know, court outcomes and things like that, that are also useful. There's also probation data sets, um, there's arrests and things like that. For the purposes of today, we're going to really focus on, um, um, you know, jail and prison data. They use it, you know, it's actually, in theory, not that different from the HMIS data in terms of shelter bed management. This is just jail bed management. Um, that's how they use it. And then um, when it's used, for, it can be used for research purposes, to study incarceration policies, and for understanding cross-sector impacts of programs, policies, et cetera, particularly on the, on the legal side. Um, uh, usually it's publicly available and fairly easily requestable. There are some um, special uh, states that, uh, you know, one that comes to mind that I've worked with is Nevada that has, uh, that is not publicly available. You cannot um, access someone's legal history. Um, and so, but most places it is, uh, it's available at the individual level. It can show trends over time. Um, particularly it's used often to look at uh, return, you know, people are incarcerated and then how long is it till they come back? You know, why are they coming back? Uh, those kinds of things. Um, it can include service and health needs. Usually those are, uh, particularly on the health side, usually that's a different data set um, and a different database within the context of the jail, or it could be a contracted provider. So um, it may include indicators for service needs like um, somebody who has psychiatric needs, for example. Um, it's fairly easy to match it to other service sectors. Um, demographic data is, is limited or inconsistent. It's just not um, something that is well collected or um, consistently collected. Um, publicly available data, like when you're looking at something like, um, what's the count in, in the jail or something like that. It's a snapshot. It's not a comprehensive look of like the flow of the system over time. Um, charges and bookings are inherently subjective and depending on um, an officer's inter or many officers interpretation. Um, you know, a lot of people are in jail without having been, um, they're in, without having, you know, been in court yet. And they're held there, um, and so there's, you know, it's not necessarily that there's an admission of guilt by somebody being incarcerated. And data may not be consistent across different police departments or sheriff's office offices. Um, the federal government, the Bureau of Justice Statistics, collects uh, federal, state, and jurisdictional data um, from jails, uh, you know, state prisons, and then federal prisons. Um, from and they report out on on those across time. There's always a huge lag on that data. Um, I think what's the most recent one is 2018, maybe right now. Yeah, that yeah, really slowed down during the Trump administration as well. Um, and then um, you know, like I said, there could be different privacy um, you know barriers in different places um, and can vary by state you know jurisdiction. Um, Consult your consult legal counsel. Um, typically, you know, I've worked with a fair amount of jail systems, and some have been really, really willing to just zip out a data file, and others, you know, took a much more measured approach. Um, but usually, does not require a BAA or 
uh, anything more than a, a straightforward DUA or MOU to, to share data with, for a specific use case. Um, the sources are if, um, you know, if it's a county jail, it would be the sheriff's office. Um, you know, it could be a city, a city jail. Um, and then you have state departments of correction, which usually monitor the prison population. So that was that. And I think I'll turn it back to Gabe. Yep. Thanks, Kim. Uh, we can just go to the next two slides. I'm going to walk through a bit of an equity analysis and sort of community process piece. But to get that kicked off, I did want to just clarify uh, one sort of language difference, which is between equity and equality. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, equality is framed in terms of access or opportunity. So a system might be said to have equality when it doesn't actively prevent people from one group uh, from availing themselves of support. Whereas equity, on the other hand, is really about outcomes. Uh, so it's when a person's race or ethnicity doesn't have a bearing on what outcomes they achieve within a system. Uh, next slide. So really simply put, uh, if our systems were equitable, we'd expect to see a distribution of people across them that's in line with the you know, overall population in the same geography that they operate in. Uh, we know that this isn't the case. We don't really need to do super deep analysis to understand that or to sort of come to that conclusion. But where the analysis is really helpful is in trying to get this answer of, you know, how far are we from that state? Uh, and what maybe do we have to do in order to get there or get closer to there? Uh, next slide. So the analysis that I'm gonna be walking through is based on uh, racial disparities and disproportionality index. This is a methodology that CSH has been employing to look at equity and outcomes uh, across a number of systems. There's quite a few that we think about when we think about folks who have needs consistent with supportive housing. Uh, it's a two-step process, a little bit different from how a lot of people tend to do equity reporting. Um, we calculate disproportionality rates for groups based on you know, an outcome population and sort of the broader universe of people that it's involved in, and then combine those rates to get this index value. Uh, and next slide. So just when we talk about the index, uh, we can interpret that as the likelihood of one group experiencing an event compared to the likelihood of another group experiencing the same event. Uh, so this is actually taken out of some academic work that was done in child welfare. Uh, but we find it's really helpful to sort of as a lens to apply to a lot of different systems. And next slide. Um, so just as we run through these things, I'm going to try and do that quickly because I'm trying to, I want to be mindful of time. Um, the index values are relative. They compare one group to uh, everyone not from that group. An index value of one tells us that that group is not uh, more or less likely to experience an outcome than other people not from that group. Uh, an index less than one means that group is less likely to experience that event. And an index value of uh, greater than one means that group is more likely to experience that event. And next slide. Uh, so just by way of an example, uh, within a, you know, say within the justice system, the disparity index for a black, black or African American population is calculated relative to the rate for all non black, non African American populations. And this is, I think, a really interesting uh, approach to just doing this kind of math, because it doesn't use the white population's experience of that system as the relative norm, you know, against which we're comparing everything else. Uh, and next slide, or next two slides, I guess. Uh, so the data that we're going to be looking at uh, comes out of Stella. And just as a quick review, uh, Stella is a HUD product. It synthesizes some of the data from HMIS that Kim was describing uh, and tells us a lot of things about systems utilization, uh, outcomes for households, things like exits, uh, where people are exiting to, returns to homelessness, and so on. I'm just gonna walk through some examples um, of how we put that together for one community. Uh, great. So the first thing that we did was calculate uh, the likelihood that a people from a given group, households from a given group, come into contact or are served in HMIS uh, compared to all other groups. And when we do that, the sort of first piece is on that leftmost bar chart, we see some really stark pieces. Uh, and that was that in this community, Black or African-American households were 
just over six times more likely uh, to come into contact with the homeless system than non-Black households. Uh, and also Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islander households were just over seven times more likely. It's a small number um, in this community, but a pretty substantial disparity. Uh, what we did from there was then look at within the system. So once we narrow down the universe to everybody who's touched the homeless system, what are the likelihood that different outcomes uh, you know, manifest for those groups? So that they'd be served in different settings and so on. Uh, and what we see there is this trend um, in particular with the black or African-American households that they are uh, less likely to be served in permanent supportive housing um, compared to other groups. Uh, we also saw very low rates of permanent supportive housing amongst American Indian or Alaska Native uh, populations. And uh, there's sort of an unknown category, which is your, your missing data. Uh, next slide. And then we can also look at this by different types of households. So we slice this, uh, not just all households, but now looking at family households. So those that present with uh, adults and children. And here we saw a really stark disparity uh, of Black or African-American households being 11.7 times more likely uh, to uh, family households to touch the system compared to non-Black uh, family households. Next slide. Uh, next, we looked at exits. So who was exiting the uh, homeless system and what kind of destinations they were exiting to. Stella breaks things down into permanent, temporary, and unknown destinations. Um, so we looked at sort of the differences there and saw some interesting pieces around sort of the uh, relatively higher likelihood for uh, white, uh, Hispanic, and Latino, families to exit to uh, permanent destinations, although we also see a relatively high rate of return in that population also. So the interplay between those two things uh, is very interesting, I think. And we can skip uh, two slides ahead just to hit some of the final pieces uh, while being mindful of time. So a lot of the purpose of this is uh, using the data to drive community conversation uh, and not just using the data in and of itself. So. I think this connects to a lot of the questions that Bentley posed in her section about data use cases, but thinking through you know, what data is being collected and why, uh, what questions are being asked, and then using the analysis to actually pull those questions amongst people in the community uh, and try to, through that, determine what better questions you know, could we be asking uh, that align with people's experiences. Uh, next slide. Um, so, you know, again, driving insights uh, based on lived experience is kind of the, the name of the game for how we're taking this work. So using the analysis as a jumping off point for community conversations uh, and not as sort of the, the means to an end, we definitely take the framing of the data itself is not the story, uh, but it does provide really good context um, to interpret stories or to, you know, take things out from uh, how other people uh, experience those different systems and to provide some like scaffolding for understanding those different pieces. Um, and I think just to be mindful of time, I wanted to make sure that um, we call out that the ultimate point here like, is to transform systems. So just having that community conversation is uh, one step, but ultimately we want to take that feedback from the community and think about what are the implications in terms of intervention design, uh, policy change, and things like that, so that we can better serve affected individuals and families, and ultimately try and get upstream of some of the factors that drive inequities and the different outcomes that we're looking at. Uh, I think we can jump to ahead. I just wanted to make sure that we had time for uh, the Dash folks to have any close out pieces or uh, things that they wanted to make sure they hit. Thanks so much, Gabe, and thanks, Bentley and Kim. Um, I think this has been really informative. Um, just a couple of wrap up points. Um, if folks are able to take our exit survey, that'd be really well appreciated. We really enjoy all the feedback that um, folks have given us through this um, series. And if you have any questions, please feel free to either put them in the chat or reach out to myself and I can pass them along and we can connect offline to answer anything. 
Um, very quickly, um, wanted to give you a heads up that as we are starting to come to the tail end of the um, of this program cycle, we'll be um, sending out final evaluations in December. Um, but in the meantime, if your contact information for your group has changed, um, please feel free to reach out. And a uh, note on the following events that we'll hopefully see you at. We have a final cross cohort webinar in October. October 20th, led by Elevate House, um, and still time to register for the all-in national meeting. Um, and we'll be touching on topics such as this um, throughout the three days. So it should be a good time and we hope it'll be very um, informative for folks. So uh, yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Um, again, thanks so much um, to our presenters today for being able to um, sit down and share um, their insights with us. And so. Yeah, I'll leave the exit survey going up a little bit longer if folks um, still want to take it, but thanks so much. And we'll share out these recordings and slides um, afterwards. <laughs>